Uh, Brian Hickman. Steve Romine. What if I should go in again? Hold on. Uh, Carter Sinclair, member. Rob McPherson with Planning, Design, and Development, Parks and Recreation. Charity, Parks and Rec Liaison. Well, I'm Elaine Lynn. I'm the um, staff liaison, and also we have Bill Hart on the line. Yeah. I can figure out how to. I can see, hear you, but I can't see you. And that's okay, Bill. If you want to just participate, I mean, if you can't figure out, doesn't you? We can still hear you, so you're able to participate. Um, okay. Hey everyone, this is Cole Fisher with the SGA office. Good afternoon, Chad Morris with Park. Now I can see you. <laughs> Bill Hart. <laughs> Welcome, Bill. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first, we need an approval of last meeting's minutes. It was January 11th, 2021. This is Kim Schuler. I'm here too. I didn't say anything before, but I motion to approve. <laughs> Second. Hi. <laughs> Great. Hi, Kim. All right. Um, and we have some new business. We're gonna. Um, uh, and I'm gonna let Elaine introduce our guests that are on um, today that we can um, get into our presentation. Yes, we're super excited to have Rob McPherson, who is um, one of my colleagues. He's a landscape architect in the planning design and development group of the uh, division of the Parks and Rec Department under Chad Morris's leadership. And we also have um, Ethan Kaysen, who's in landscape services recreation specialist, and both of them will be presenting today um, at your all request on Marshview Park and the improvements that are happening there that have um, to do with bike and trails. So we'll start with Rob and then Ethan will follow up with, pre with presenting more information. So Rob, you just tell me when you're ready to share um, your screen and Trina, I'm gonna try to take back over the presenter. Sure. You want me to put up your slide? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, as Elaine said, my name's Rob McPherson with the Planning Design and Development Division. And I'm just going to go over a little bit of uh, background on the Marshview Park site. Um, then Ethan is going to talk about some recent developments with uh, trails. Um, so uh, this is the preferred master plan from the original um, uh, process of uh, trying to gain uh, public consensus. Uh, so to, to back up a little bit, the, the property is a about 98 acres. Um, it was purchased by the Navy in the 80s to prevent um, residential development um, in the vicinity of uh, Oceana Naval Air Station. Um, in about 2005, the Navy offered it for sale to the, the city through the open space program and Parks and Recreation started um, master planning to see what uh, the local residents would uh, be interested in seeing on the property. Um, in about 2010, the sale finally went through, uh, at which time this master plan had already been completed. If you could click to the next slide, Elaine. Yeah. So in the uh, northern half of the site, um, what what was uh, intended to be phase one was um, uh, more intensive development, um, an open play area 
some parking, small parking lots to provide access, um, dog parks and some paved trails as well as uh, a larger playground and a couple of smaller playgrounds. Next. So on the, on the southern half of the site, uh, it was intended to be less uh, developed and more of a passive uh, recreation opportunity. There are already uh, a number of existing trails throughout the site um, that have been used uh, over the years by uh, the people that live around the property. Um, next. So, uh, currently finishing up, we are uh, developing, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, that's supposed to say 2014. I don't know why it dropped the, the four down to the, to the second uh, uh, line, but in 2014, we developed a paved trail ahead of phase one to provide some access to the, to the site. So, uh, the area outlined in the red dash line uh, was prior to phase one uh, paved trail that goes from Marshview Drive on the left uh, down to Virginia Avenue on the right and included uh, three bridges to, to make it that possible because there are several uh, drainage ditches or creeks through the site, uh, particularly a major one that runs right through the middle. Um, next, Elaine. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, one more. So here, um, currently finishing up construction um, is uh, the phase one portion that I mentioned. We have um, to the left, there are four dog parks, a parking lot, and a stormwater management facility. Um, through the middle of the site on the other side of the ditch from the, the previous trail project, there's a paved trail that um, connects the different uh, new construction as well as uh, from Marshview Drive all the way down to Virginia Avenue. Uh, in the middle, there is a uh, open play area and another parking lot that connects to uh, Indian Road. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Ethan to talk about um, some of the uh, phase two developments that we'll be looking at. Okay, um, is Ethan, are you on the line? Is Ethan here? Yeah, Ethan, so if you'll just unmute yourself to begin, but Rob, I forgot one thing I probably should open this with, and if you could speak to a little bit about this, I'm not sure all the committee members know where Marshview Park is, so if you can just kind of bound it by, you know, north, south, east, west, give a frame of reference, um, that might be helpful. I'm sorry. So it's um, south of... Norfolk Avenue, uh, about a block <laughs> south of Norfolk Avenue. It's about a block east of Birdneck Road. Um, the, the water to the southeast of the site actually ties into um, uh, Owls Creek and Rudy Inlet uh, further to the south and east. East of the site is the Western edge of the Shadow Lawn neighborhood and uh, south of the site is SeaTac. Thank you, Rob. All right, Ethan, you're on. I'm showing Ethan is not muted. But Ethan, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Um, 
<clears throat> Ethan, if you can type in the chat, if you're having any difficulties, uh, let us know and. And Trina, from the way I'm sharing my screen, I can't even see a chat. So if Ethan does, would you please um, step in? It shows that he's not muted and he just checked it and his side is showing the same thing. That's what I'm seeing. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on. with the Okay. Audio. All right. Well, all right, Rob, not to put you on the spot, but since you're working with Ethan, if you want to say a few words. Can you hear me now? What, Oh, yeah. there he is. <laughs> Just you can to hear make me? a time. Yeah, we can hear okay. you. You're on. All right. Awesome. Sorry about that. That um, million options here. Okay. Um, awesome. So, uh, as Elaine mentioned, uh, my name is Ethan Kaysen. Uh, I work with Park and Landscape Services for the uh, City of Virginia Beach, and uh, this is a division within Parks and Recreation. Um, and I've been working uh, with Rob and meeting Rob on site. Um, I have a PowerPoint. Um, I asked Elaine uh, last week at the last minute if I could hold off um, on showing it. And I know some of y'all um, had inquired if I had a map or anything to show. Uh, while I do, um, we are just waiting some really final uh, approvals uh, from our director, Michael Kirschman, and uh, some of our administrators. Um, and also, um, we're waiting on a programming agreement that we actually have with the volunteer group. Um, the city attorney just kind of approved what I typed up. So it's looking really good for this agreement. Um, uh, but I, before I showed you anything, I just want to make sure all that was concrete. Um, but I'm going to go in and talk and just tell you just a little bit. Um, uh, essentially, like Rob said, uh, if you go down General Booth and go to the Rudy Inlet, um, right there on 9th Street, which is North Avenue, you take a left and Marshview Park is down that way. Um, it's actually a really awesome site. It's about 96 acres there on the, uh, um, when you were looking at that picture earlier with the red dotted lines that Rob had, we see the asphalt path, the big open side there to the left. Uh, you can see where the master plan kind of had um, where uh, some bike paths would be. Um, currently, there's about four miles of soft trails uh, that exist, and I'm going to call them social trails for the purpose that they were just kind of created by the community over years. Um, people have used uh, BMX bikes, mountain bikes on them, um, even ATV um, and dirt bikes, uh, which is not permitted, um, but is a very big piece of property uh, with um, multiple uh, communities around it. Um, currently, uh, back there, uh, everything happens with teenagers from uh, airsoft to paintball. Um, we've had um, issues with illegal hunting, unfortunately, because um, again, it's a really nice prime piece of natural area. Um, that people take advantage of illegally. Uh, the really awesome thing about putting in some type of formal um, trail system, uh, not just for mountain bikes, but for trail runners, hikers alike, anyone, um, is really a, the more usage we'll get out of that area, the more that legal, legal activity will actually leave. And that's something that we've seen across a lot of our open space and natural areas here uh, with the city of Virginia Beach. Um, the volunteer group that I've uh, been working with and contacting with is uh, EVMA. Some of y'all, I'm sure, have heard of them or maybe talked with them in the past. Um, they are the Eastern Virginia Mountain Biking Association. Uh, essentially, what they do is that they partner with different municipalities or cities or counties um, and work with pieces of land that the cities or counties would own, and they would build and construct um, mountain biking trails that they have designed. Uh, basically for public use and then they maintain them as a volunteer group and keep them in good shape they inspect them uh, and that whole nine yards just to have a great uh, trail system that people could use uh, so we actually met with the evma this past fall and did an inventory and a scouting of the trails and showed them everything that was there um, and they were very interested in working with us um, so one of the big pieces that we've been working on is not only this partnership agreement um, before our director would say, yeah, go ahead and do it. You know, of course, they want to see a layout and a map of the trails, which that's the big thing that I've been working with on EVMA is how we're going to use the property. Uh, the biggest thing that we want to do uh, here in Park and Landscape Services and Parks and Rec is that we want the trails basically to be very sustainable. Um, sustainable trails is minimal impact to the environment, but giving passive recreation to public to be able to enjoy and, and use safely. Um, the good thing is, is these trails are already there, so we're not going through um, and really disturbing an environmental uh, footprint 
uh, for the fact that they're already used. I was actually just there. Um, and you can see from even though it's so muddy, you can see where people have already been riding their bikes along these trails. Um, the reason I say it's not formal is because nothing in the past, we've never had any uh, trailhead maps, um, wayfinding signs, there's no trail markers. So uh, right now it's really just a spider web of trails that the community has built. Um, so one of the things that uh, we're gonna be looking into is uh, having, using the IMBA, uh, the International Mountain Biking Association, they have a set of standards, is basically having a level of experience uh, or skill level for all users. Um, and that's everything from an easy trail um, that's double track um, that is open to still open to hiking and still open um, to whether you want to bird watch or trail run or any of that. Um, and that's uh, would be an easy green circle. And then you have you know your blue square, which is a little bit more uh, elevation turns, a uh, few more little obstacles as far as routes in your way. And then uh, what's really unique about uh, Marshview Park. Um, which a lot of people who mountain bike have experience doing are going to be gr uh, really excited to hear this, is given our area, we'll actually be able to have some trails that are black diamond. Now, a lot of people hear that and they say, oh man, black diamond, they think of skiing and they think of like the hardest trail in the world and we can't have any of that. That sounds crazy. Um, it's not as crazy as some people have seen because given our area, there's really no topography around, as y'all know, it's, it's, we live in a very flat region. Um, but what makes it really unique is what Rob was saying back in the, the 70s and 80s is when this was going to be developed before uh, the government purchased it and then gave it over to us is that um, they, they actually had gone through the park uh, when it was going to be developed and actually dug ditches and they're about 15 foot deep and piled all that dirt up next to it. So you essentially have a 15 foot hill going down uh, to a 30 foot slope all the way down to the ditch. And there's some really awesome topography based off of what um, those ditches and berms offer. Uh, so in EVMA, when the when they saw it, those guys, you know, they mountain bike. When they saw it, they were they were just sparkly eyed and giggly um, about the opportunities that that we could do there. Um, so really, to to round this all up, we're we're looking at uh, formalizing through these uh, wayfinding posts through signage. Um, of having about three different difficulties of trail back there but and all in all we have about four and a half miles now we're going to end up with probably around six miles of trails which is really good for um the acreage and the size of marshview park um these trails the main thing that we do want to uh, let people know is that they're not mountain bike only trails that we say single track which basically as you all probably know it's just 24 to 30 inches on general is the width of the trail um, but hikers and trail runners, people from the community would still be open to these trails. Bikers would just be yielding to those pedestrians. Um, and that's pretty much IMBA rules and standards, um, which is, uh, you know, national known that uh, bikers just yield to those who are uh, pedestrians on the trail. Um, I kind of talk fast, so hopefully y'all guys got that. Does anybody have any questions? Or do you want to hold that in lane? How do you want to do that? No, this is a perfect time. And also just to um, make the point, am I echoing? I don't know why I'm echoing. I hear an echo. Okay. So if you're not speaking, please mute yourself unless you're Ethan or Rob. <laughs> um, but uh, to echo Ethan's point that, uh, of course, bicyclists yielding to pedestrians is also the MUTCD, the AASHTO, the FHWA standard as well. Um, but this would be perfect time for questions. If, if anyone has questions for Ethan or Rob, um, please unmute and say your name and uh, go ahead. Hi, Ethan Hi, and Rob. This is Amy Frostick. I, I think somebody else is talking at the same time. Um, Thank you for um, coming and visiting us and, and giving us this presentation. I'm really excited about it. Um, my husband and I went down and we actually um, mountain biked through there and it was such a great property and we're excited not only to ride our mountain bikes through it, but also to run through it now that we know trail runners are welcome as well. Um, how many miles were, will there be total? I know you said four miles now. Is it? Um, do you expect more than that? Yeah, probably close to six. Um, mainly because the trails that are there now, um, I'd say at least 80% of the trails there now are, are really a straight shot trail that somebody had made just like straight down, um, which, which is fine, especially for like a, what we would call like an easy trail. Um, but there's so much opportunity to, um, with given the way the hills and the berms are there is to really make that straight line a little bit more, um, a little bit more twists and turns. Um, 
we're also, um, I'd also say about 75% of the trails that are there now are like completely established. Like you could go walk them right now without having to walk through any brush or anything. There will be some um, small vegetation clearing um, and removing like the forest floor of sticks and debris in order to get some of these trails just to connect them. Uh, when I actually went out there with uh, my GPS device and tracked all these trails, it was about 17 different segments of trails right now that all spider web together. Um, and we're basically going to be looking at splitting the property in two with a double track trail, um, which would be an easy trail. Um, but branching off of that, what you'd have your easy, you'd have your medium, then you have your more difficult um, trails. So basically, you could go down this middle trail on um, that would be both ways, which is double track and you'd be able to connect to all the other trails on the property. So it'd be about six miles. Well, that's exciting. After I had to talked to you originally, I also joined EVMA. So I'm excited nice. for updates for through them too. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Ethan, Hugh Tierney here. Uh, longtime resident of Shadow Lawn, and I've been hiking there illegally for 20 years before it became legal to do that. So just want to say the neighborhood's very excited uh, to hopefully, Chad, get that park open here real soon. Um, so, and it is going to be highly used, but um, two quick points. Um, and I think I heard you say it. I just want to pose the question for any and every trail that exists or gets cut in, will all trails be 100% accessible to pedestrians? Yes. So um, to reiterate it, if you've been hiking there during the daytime, you're fine. You just can't trespass on city property at night. So no night hiking right. there. Everybody <laughs> knows that. Yeah. Good deal. Um, so yes, all these trails will be open and it will be permitted for pedestrians to use them. Um, I'll use the term accessible usually in the sense of, um, you know, they won't, they won't tend to be what's ADA compliant. Now, the, there are trails that are there now that are the asphalt path and the new asphalt path on the other side, um, which is good mileage for that. Um, and some the easy trails are relatively flat, and those are very, you know, what I say, accessible. Um, the trails are going to be cut in and using the berms that we're going to be calling Black Diamond, mainly just because it's so much up and down. Those, those I mean, in my opinion, I like the trail run. Um, I don't have a mountain bike, but I would be, I'll be running those all the time. So they're going to be open as permitted for pedestrians to use them. Um, so I guess, depending on your skill level of, um, of hiking um, or whatnot, you know, it's not going to be closed. It's not going to, there's going to be no trails or a mountain bike only to pretty much. Something. Okay. That, that, that was the question. Yeah. Num number two, uh, some group, I'm assuming the city has already been in there and done a little bit of the cleanup where the trails cross some of the minor creeks um, to make them a little more accessible. Are there gonna be some bridges or, cause there are several small little, smaller tributaries that are muddy for 10 feet to 20 feet wide. Is there a plan to address those or, or it just in concept, I don't, I don't mean details, just, just so people can walk, hike and walk through them. Yeah, there are. Chad can also, and, and, and Rob can definitely alliterate on this as well um, from a planning and design standpoint. Um, but there will be, we are proposing, there's uh, basically for what EVMA and I scouted and came up with, we're going to need uh, four bridges. Um, and um, that's something that we have discussed on if we're going to fabricate those in-house or um, or they have to meet a certain standard. Uh, Chad, did you want to uh, talk on that at all? Yeah, um, thanks, you. That's a good question. There are uh, I think the plan is that we will be constructed in house, and as long as we keep the bridges um, 30 inches or lower above crossing the water or the ditch or the low area, um, we don't need handrails. So it'll just be a 30 inch wide crossing that could be used, same width as what the normal trail width would be um, to get, yeah. get back and forth across some of these waterways. Good. And Walter, I believe you have a question. You want to go next? Well, I just wanted to applaud you for a couple of things. One, for reaching out and working with the citizens group. There is such demand for mountain biking here in the city because there aren't many other facilities that are open to it legally. And so thank you for creating this. Second, it's just fortuitous that the location of Marshview Park happens to be a block south 
of the Virginia Beach Trail portion that's already built out, that mile and a half that's already here as part of the South Beach Trail. So for people who are riding that loop that goes out Norfolk Avenue, goes down General Booth and so on, this is a great diversion in the center where you can get out in the trees and see something a little different. It's really awesome. My wife and I were down there riding it too, and we're just very excited for all of this. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I do, I, I greatly apologize. No excuses. I really wanted to show this presentation today. I have a small team of three people and two of us were out on PHE COVID leave um, for like the past month. So we've been hit pretty crazy over here on, in my department on well, my unit, like I said, it's three people. Um, so it kind of was a little bit backlogged with this presentation. I had some some really good stuff to show y'all, but as soon as it is approved, and I'm I'm thinking within like the next week, um, I could I can get this to Elaine um, if anyone's interested in seeing it. Yeah, that's one thing we can easily do. And thank you, Ethan. Appreciate you um, playing catch up here. And if and when Ethan has um, those master plans, then feel free to save them as PDFs. Thing, Ethan, yep. Me and I can send them out to BTEC. Are there any other questions for Rob or Ethan? And thank you both for your time and joining us today. Yeah, I I will say real quick, Elaine, just to close um, the last thing, because, you know, this this project is, I guess, is not as traditional as you would say, as um, in the sense of, um, you know, what was just done on the other side of the park. Um, so we don't technically have, quote unquote, funding set aside for a lot of the signage. Um, you know, when we have signage at some of our other parks that we may need to replace, you're looking at one or two signs at a time. I mean, here we're kind of hoping um, preliminary thoughts, but we're thinking about at least two trailhead maps at either entrance of Marshview Drive and then Virginia Avenue. Um, but between the intersections of all these trails, so people know how to get back to the park a lot, and they know which trail they're on, between wayfinding posts, mileage markers, um, and just interpretive signage, um, we're, we're looking at a lot of signs that we're going to be uh, purchasing, uh, essentially. Um, so I will be working with our marketing department um, and also possibly with the Parks and Rec Foundation um, on looking at whether it's um, any companies or um, anyone who wants to help fund or see this come to fruition. After it's approved, that, that's our next step is looking at um, getting all those things. We're looking at, uh, at Norfolk Avenue at the oceanfront and at Great Neck, there's a bike repair station. Those are coming really handy. So we're thinking about having some of these here too, because we're not gonna have a lot of use. Um, so if, if anyone is interested in that, as soon as, like I said, our our director approves this and um, risk management's already signed off on it, which is a great thing. And our city attorney just said the agreement looks good. So hopefully once all that is um, has a final stamp of approval, we'll be going that direction. So if anyone is interested or anything like that. Um, no okay. And Ethan, we have in the chat that Liz Putnam says, looking forward to working with you on this project and Fat Frogs is in. Please contact us about donations. We are excited. Cool. So thanks again um, to both of you. And thanks, Thank you. Uh, BTAC and everyone for um, your support on this. And, uh, back. Thank you. Thank you all. Great, thanks. Um, we're moving on now to new business. Uh, Oh, no, that was new business, unfinished business. Uh, volunteer hours are due prior to the last day of each month. If everybody could uh, please remember to do that. I finally have put this as a calendar reminder so I can get it to Trina monthly because I am guilty of not giving them over to her as promptly as I should. So um, if we could all stay on top of that, that would be great. And um, we're going to talk about the active transportation plan. Elaine has been working so hard. Um, talk to city council and um, all kinds of different groups about the active transportation plan. So she's going to update us on where we are with that. Elaine. Yes, thanks, Amy. Uh, yeah, as you all know, this has been a two year long labor of love, <laughs> but we're finally getting to the end and ready to cross the finish line um, on January 13th. So um, just about the time of our last meeting um, on January 13th, um, I presented to the planning commission and it was voted on uh, recommend to, to recommended approval uh, and headed off to city council. Then that's where their recommendation goes and um, chair Frostick and vice chair camp did a wonderful job speaking uh, at, uh, at that time. And then also at city council, just uh, 2 weeks ago, I guess it was now in support of the plan um, and on uh, representing all of you. And um, the work that you've put, it, put into this and how we're able to use this going forward for the next 5, 10, 20 years. 
So on February 2nd, that is when we presented to uh, city council. I gave a briefing. Uh, and then tomorrow, February 16th, it, um, the active transportation plan is again on city council agenda, this time for public hearing and uh, anticipating a vote uh, for city council to um, vote to yay or nay to determine whether we can have this adopted as um, amendment to the city of Virginia Beach comprehensive plan as a planning document. Um, and I do see, and not to put you on the spot, but I do see council member Henley uh, and also council member Tower on the line. I know both of you heard the presentation and are, are expecting to see this again tomorrow and maybe hear from the public and vote. Um, if you have anything you'd like to add to that, I'm sure the committee would love to um, hear your perspective on the plan um, at this time. Uh, this is Barbara Handel. I know the uh, presentation I think was very well received and I've heard no comments. I expect it should be passed, but uh, we'll wait to see what the public has to say. And otherwise, I think we're good to go tomorrow. And thank you a lot. Thank you, Ms. Henley. Uh, this is Guy Tower. Thank you for letting me join you today. I would just, I would echo Ms. Henley's remarks. I thought it, uh, I, I certainly appreciated it. Thought it was very well done. I've not had any discussions with other council members about it. Looking forward to the hearing myself. And while I've got the floor, just let me thank everybody that's uh, worked on Marshview Park too. That's a it's a great idea, terrific uh, asset to the community. And I'm personally very grateful to all of you that have had a hand in it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Tower. And that wraps that back to you, Amy. Okay, great. So now we're gonna go over some reports. Um, first, bike month 2021 subcommittee. Um, we have a few members that stepped up to help with bike month this year. Um, it is in May and it's coming um, quickly. May will be here before we know it. Um, and so we have different ideas that we're working with right now. Um, a few of them are some virtual rides and challenges. Uh, we have uh, a bingo, um, so, so some different ideas that we're all taking charge of and um, hopefully we'll be able to present more to you in March on some finalization of that. Um, we even had, I had our graphic designer at JNA um, come up with a great bike month logo for Virginia Beach. Um, maybe we can, you know, get some money for the foundation uh, through some of these virtual challenges. So um, stand by, we have, we're going to give you more of an update um, in March at the meeting, but we have some good ideas coming forth. Um, does anybody from the subcommittee want to? chime in on anything uh, i was wondering on the is there insurance if they do like one of the things of virtual you know going to 50 miles or something your own 50 is there would we have to worry about insurance or anything or liability uh, with the virtual challenges that we've done through J and A, the there is a virtual insurance that you can purchase it's 55 dollars um, so we can talk about that through, for the, through the budget process, but, um, there are companies that give virtual insurance. Um, but we're going to, I'll talk with Walter too, as he's going to help me a little bit with the waiver. <laughs> yeah, I was talking about the accidents, you know, potential, but you know, I don't want to be, I don't want the city to be responsible. So. And if I may, and to that point, um, yeah, that's, there, I'm sure there's all sorts of things that. That I'm not even aware aware or haven't occurred to me since I don't really um, spend much time planning events like this. But I will say that um, the, of course, city staff uh, up through legal and Michael and Chad and myself were available to coordinate things such as even in this time of COVID. Like I know Brian had a question and I wasn't able to get you an answer in time for the meeting. But just even like how we coordinate that with what's appropriate for can you have a tent and pass out water bottle? I mean what. It's so different right now, um, in addition to the normal event planning stuff. So, um, but we'll all continue to work together and please don't hesitate to reach out to staff when you do have questions like that and how events are normally handled that are also therefore sponsored or encouraged through the city, even though it's your committee. Thanks. Q here, I have uh, one other thing I worked on over the last few days. Um, Elaine was kind enough to share that at Mount Trashmore, I think we have about a two and a half mile loop uh around 
around that. So didn't know if there is something that could be worked out with that. Um, in a somewhat related way, uh, I reached out to uh, Kevin Will, who's the president of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southeastern Virginia, as well as a gentleman by the name of Mike Swift, who's the past president of Bone Shaker Social Club. And one of their big events every year is at Christmas time. They build a couple of hundred bikes that they pass out to children. And so I'm thinking there might be some opportunity to put these groups together to do a little ride or whatever uh, at Mount Trashmore and bring in the uh, children from Boys and Girls Clubs and have some bikes that Bone Shakers could donate. So. I just kicked that off the conversation last week. COVID obviously can make this a challenge, but uh, they're gonna get back to me and see if there's something that can be done along those lines. I think it would be a great way to get the community involved uh, in bike month, um, you know, with the charitable, um, you know, flavor to it. That's a great idea, Hugh. Stay tuned. <laughs> well, good. Well, we hope to have a lot more updates for y'all in March. Um, so we're gonna move on to the 2020 annual report to city council and Walter um, Camp, our vice chair is gonna speak to that. Well, first I wanted to uh, thank Elaine for her work in going back and compiling all of the accomplishments and data uh, she shared with you a, a first run on that last month, and I think it took 20 minutes to just go through the bullet points. Now I'm charged with adding words to that, which is good for an attorney. That's what we do. But I don't think city council is looking for a bound hardback volume. So trying to put this in a brief fashion that educates people to the context has been the challenge. And what I mean by that is these things don't just happen out of thin air, that these projects that we want to share with council and celebrate for our city are the result of having a plan and then year after year applying for those state grants from VDOT and from other sources to execute the plan. Yeah. So it's not just ticking off the projects, it's painting the picture of this is an ongoing living process and we're just taking a segment of time and showing what was accomplished. Of course, we've done so much more than that too. Uh, but we'll be wrapping that up, the subcommittee of uh, Amy and Elaine and I, and uh, getting the letter and the photos and all that, and uh, you'll see it soon. Thanks, Walter. Uh, the Virginia Beach Trail on Wavy TV 10. I don't know if anybody saw that segment, but Elaine's going to share it with us. I am going to attempt to share with you <laughs> my 50 50 success rate on this. Okay, can you all see my screen? Let's start with that one. Is that a yes? Okay, good. Thanks, Dream. Okay, can you hear that? that okay, good. Here we go. It's only about two minutes long. They just have to get the funding needed to move forward with it. Tell your sides, Katie Collette has the story. It's called the Virginia Beach Trail, and its approval actually dates back to 1981. Virginia Beach Trail is a long-term project that will connect parts of our city that are currently hard to navigate by walking and biking. Walter Camp of the Virginia Beach Bikeways and Trails Advisory Committee says it would be a 10-foot wide paved shared-use path through the former Norfolk Southern Railway corridor. Now this is the same corridor where light rail could have existed but was voted down by Virginia Beach residents years ago. The Virginia Beach Trail would stretch the length of the city east to west from the city limit line at Newtown Road all the way to the oceanfront. There are so many other spurs and smaller trails that could connect to this, but this would truly be almost like our super highway for active transportation, a, a spine, a spine of active transportation network, a primary network through our city. Elaine Lynn, active transportation planner for Virginia Beach Parks and Rec, says the corridor is 66 feet wide, so in the future it could be used by bicyclists, pedestrians, and some sort of rapid transit other than light rail, all at the same time. Katie Collette. Well, so that's the gist of it. 
Thanks for taking that moment. I don't know if you did have a chance to see that before, but we're just really excited about that and, and just appreciative for Wavy TV 10 um, for giving us, I guess, the opportunity, asking us to do that little spot. Um, and, and it's really great to showcase, um, I guess, premier projects that we do have. That is a, a perfect example of what is in the active transportation plan. It is a long term plan. A piece of that trail is already built one and a half miles on the e to the east, uh, heading to our oceanfront. But, you know, without a plan and without a vision, without calling these projects by name, uh, and seek actively seeking funding, they cannot be built. So we're really excited about that. And that was something again, that, um, we were interviewed by Katie Collette. Um, but it, as part of that, I guess, um, I'll just, just share, um, Walter Camp and I did both both post that individually. Actually, I posted, I think Walter just um, referenced it or something on, on our LinkedIn pages, our own individual professional LinkedIn pages. And I think the count now is that, oh, sorry. I think I've still got that thing on repeat. Okay, so I, I think the count is now that it's had over 2,500 views just from, again, this is our professional LinkedIn page. And, and Walter, I'll, I'll run through this a little bit, but then if you want to chime at the end and, <laughs> and ex expand on that or, or correct me if I'm wrong here anywhere, where, but I think it's had over 2,500 views and 75 comments or reactions. And again, that's on our professional LinkedIn pages. And also Parks and Rec um, did post that, that little interview on um, Parks and Rec Facebook page. And that's received um, just about 5,000 views, 148 comments, likes and shares and zero negative feedback. So the our citizens, our city really loves this project. I mean, this has been something that has been really exciting to talk to the public about. I mean, we did try promoting, we did try going after funding in 2019 with a bill grant. Unfortunately, no one in the Commonwealth received funding during that round for a bill grant, but we're gonna continue to look for ways. Um, and it's just, it, it's just a, a positive project. And in addition to that, this is really cool. Um, um, our, our Congresswoman, Congresswoman Elaine Luria's office actually reached out to um, e emailed me saying, hey, we saw this bit and how can we help you seek funding? So um, just uh, Parks and Rec will get back with their her office um, and their federal grants officer and just see see what the opportunities are there because that, that's really exciting. Here we have you know a representative reaching out to us who's also excited about this trail and wants to get behind it. So Walter, you have anything else to add that maybe I missed? I, I just wanted to say that when I put it up on LinkedIn, I didn't reference the TV spot and I didn't do any advocacy. I just put a couple sentences defining what the project has been spelled out to be since 1980. You know, that's this wide, it runs from here to here. That was it. And because people were asking me, what is this thing? And so I wasn't saying, rah, rah, we ought to go do it. It was just, here's the definition. And 25 people have hit that view and sent it elsewhere. And so I'm just astonished. I never expected that. And I see in the comments, the a request to share that link. Um, I sure will. I'll put it in the chat. Let me just get it. Oh, way to go, Trina, on it. If you're on LinkedIn, hit hashtag VB trail, all smashed together as one word. It's a, I'm not a social media guy, but I tried creating a hashtag and look what happened. Walter's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Walter, for all your, all your advocacy. Um, so Elaine, okay, you mentioned that, that you mentioned that the city of Virginia beach has a federal grants officer. Do you know their name? Oh, no, the, I'm sorry. The Congresswoman's office has a federal grants officer. I, oh, I wish okay. we did. <laughs> I'll volunteer. I'll volunteer. Wait, I've, I've there. Can a lot of experience with grants. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, I'm always looking for opportunities to write grants. So as those come up, I'm, you know, because right now, if it's for bikeways and travel, that, that's me. That's me and whoever I can rope in to help me. <laughs> so, uh, and oftentimes, too, I do try to find a little piece of my budget to, um, like for that build grant, we had the assistance of Kimley Horn helping us with that because uh, such a he has such a heavy lift. So yeah, I mean, absolutely, I, I can't do it all myself. So thank you. Good, that's I appreciate that offer. All right, Elaine, you're up next as well with the resort area mobility plan update. Okay, great. Yeah, back on. All right, so I will share my screen again. Give me a moment. All right.
a little bit of recap. Last month, I did mention, um, I think it was last month. No, maybe it was actually before that, um, or, or maybe part of that, that the ramp, the resort area mobility plan. Um, that is a project that the, it's actually um, the responsibility of the strategic growth office, area office, the SGA office. And so they have, um, um, hired uh kimley horn again actually kimley horn and um and the, uh, they have a really great team there and they put in together this uh mobility plan which is which is a recommendation that came out of them updating the race app which is the resort area strategic action plan so um now they're halfway through that and you may recall again i think it was two months ago that i had uh, reached out to y'all via email soliciting that hey if you can participate in this in this survey they're putting out there and then I, I sent another email there did a round two of a survey. Um, I think it just is concluding just just finished concluding that opening a survey. They're really trying to seek feedback and input from the public on what um, what the public wants to see as far as um, mobility, active mobility, also multimodal mobility, really in the resort area. And also, um, I think it was uh, I can't remember the um, yeah, it was January. No, I'm sorry. There was two months ago, I think it was in December, Amy and Walter, correct me if I'm wrong, if you remember the date that there was also, um, you all had an invite, uh, a link to participate in a, like a WebEx meeting like this. So, so you could um, hear where they were with the mobility plan and uh, ask questions or offer feedback at that time also. So thank you for those of you that did participate in that. So I just want to give you a quick update on January 28th. I've um, secured a few slides just to, to in, for in summary, I guess, uh, January 28th, um, Kimley Horn and, and SG office held again. This is their 6th meeting now with staff and the res resort area commission, the RAC uh, steering committee. And, um, to, I guess, kind of run through what, um, where, what, where the, where it had evolved, where they're, where they're headed with their, um. Mobility plan and um, this really exciting. I just really wanted to share with you some of um, the evolution of this. So. I mean, I, I threw in here, they have, they have a good handle on the existing facilities and, um. To that point, it was really encouraging to see that during as part of this evolution and throughout their presentation and when they went through how they um, came to their proposed recommended. Um, uh, mobility plan that they really did incorporate a lot of what we put forth in the active transportation plan. They had a really good handle on that. Um, and they referenced a lot of our best practices that were laid out within the active transportation plan, particularly in our appendix a, which is the design guidelines uh, for for um, again, best practice for for active facility. Um, uh, I'm sorry, was there a comment there? I missed that um, for for active transportation. And when when they're referring to active transportation, that also really kind of includes a micro mobility concept where it's not just for runners and walkers. It really is also for what do we do with these scooters? I and mean, what do we do with everyone? You know, runners, everyone who wants to be down there and is down there, and all the congestion and conflict that can happen in that um, when when that's happening. So um, one of the recommendations is that they are um, provide for mass transit, continuing to provide, but really in a much more robust way, which I think is really cool. Um, their concepts for that, but I'm just going to focus on more of the active transportation stuff. So again, with this ex existing slide, sorry. So the, our active transportation plan is more of a high level document and the ramp really picks up where that large scale master planned network in the active transportation plan where that leaves off so that the core city network is uh, identified in the active uh, active transportation plan. It, it connects with, with the local connectors within the resort area SGA. So it's sort of a con uh, continuum of that. Um, I'll show you. Proposed their their preferred alternative five, and they, so they've gone through quite a few. You know, well, how about this? How about this? A lot of different concepts, and this is where they're heading. I think it's really really neat how they're doing this. They're taking into account again all the best practices is highlighted in the active transportation plan. And if you look at how they're laying this out, they're accommodating vehicular traffic, single occupancy vehicle, but then they're serpentining um, the layout within from curb to curb because you really have to work in a very confined space. So, I mean, we always said the building facade, you have some sidewalk and then you've got curb. And so taking into account really budgetary limitations and what you can do with repurposing the space, they've accommodated for on-road bike lanes. That's the green, you can see the green lines. 
And north is to the right, if this helps. Okay, so this is just a concept of three typical blocks. This is not, you know, specific design, and this is not specific to any three blocks. This is a typical block section. So um, bike lanes in the green, and then the um, peach color is really more like an activated space that can be for outdoor dining. That can be, you know. Uh, gathering areas, it can be delivery takeout, and, and then um, there'll be oh, scooter parking, bike parking, you know, all the things that people want to do when they are approaching the, um, the establishment um, curbside. And then also trying to accommodate maybe, um, you know, they have to think of things like, um, what do you do with the parking? What do you do with drop off? You know, uh, you know, especially pre COVID and then it'll come back again, but all the, all the Uber users that just want to be dropped off and picked up. I mean, so there's a, a delivery. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of different users in this space that have to be accommodated and um, especially including pedestrians. So how you get all these groups, um, I guess, accommodated within the space in a safe way, minimizing conflict points and um, maximizing mobility and trying to get away from just being solely car centric and, and uh, prioritizing the single occupancy vehicle over all else. And the rest of us just sort of have to step back and and you know, bow to that. So I was really pleased with, I guess, just how this is evolving, and I commend them for their work. And all of you that did participate in, in the survey or participate in that meeting, they really have taken to heart what we um, have, uh, we and the general public have provided for them, and what we want. Um, and and um, and it's really exciting to see this, uh, I guess, materialize. So as more information comes available, I'd be happy to continue to update you on that. That was on November 12th, Elaine, that we were able to give our direct comments. And it's just astonishing to see that three months later, that has been materialized in this plan that accommodates pedestrians, bicyclists, and so many other people. It really shows how this city is open to the ideas of the public and everybody on this call, from private citizens to liaisons, members of council, retailers, members of this committee, you have a voice. And I implore you to use that voice because it's, it goes right into the end product. There's a link in the chat. There's one more day to pay to participate in the public survey if you haven't done it yet. So please do so. That's great. Um, Elaine, you still have the floor as uh, next report is Eastern shore rail to trail study completed December, 2020. Yes, this one I'll keep brief. This is um, not within our locale, but it is our neighbor. Uh, you may recall again, um, this one was actually uh, last May of 2020 that um, Amy and Walter emailed information out with a, including a, uh, that included a link um, to a VDOT survey. This is a VDOT study uh, that they conducted. And what this is, is on the Eastern shore and it's the 49 mile uh, corridor rail trail corridor so but what they were doing is it's 49 mile active transportation facility immediately north north of us and this would be a fantastic addition of course to our regional active transportation network and really boost that whole ecotourism concept that we highlight in the blue ways chapter of the active transportation plan and their study to this is to assess the feasibility of this transformation so their study to assess feasibility is now complete and the link was provided in the agenda, the corrected link. I apologize y'all for <laughs> having another blunder and having to send everything out twice, but you put a link in your agenda. And, and um, if, you have, if you're interested, please check it out, but just know um, it is good for you all to know, for all of us to know in the regional concept, what we're connecting to, just as we are the South Hampton Roads Trail, the Capitol Trail, all these things matter as it all comes down to Virginia Beach and we can connect to them and promote our, ourselves in the region. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Um, Walter, would you like to talk to us about the bike safety bill? Sure, I'll do F and G on the agenda together here in the interest of time. There are three pieces of legislation up at the state level that BTAC ought to be aware of. The first one referenced here is what's called the Bike Safety Bill, House Bill 2262. Uh, that was passed by the House and it's over on the Senate. Of course, it was carried over into the special session, so it is still live legislation. That legislation has three things that are of interest to the bicycling community. Number one, it provides that 
vehicles overtaking a bicycle, moped, animal drawn vehicle must switch out of the lane of travel into the next lane over to the left unless there is three lanes clear, three feet clearance within the lane. So in most cases, that's gonna mean an overtaking vehicle needs to switch out of the lane overtaking a bike. Uh, that's why it's called the bike safety bill. The second thing is that in certain cases, bicycles will be allowed to treat stop signs as yield signs. Now, this sounds maybe a bit counterintuitive. There are a number of factors. It must be a safe condition. But what this is about is called slow go. When a bicycle starts back up again, it's slow to get up to speed. And so when a bicycle is in the travel lane, in some cases, allowing them to yield and safely make their turn keeps traffic flowing. It means that there's less conflict between bicycles and motor vehicles by keeping the bikes moving. The third element, uh, there's a still requirement that bicyclists may not ride more than two abreast, but current law states that you must fall back into a single file line when there are vehicles overtaking. This element of the bill would strike the single file line requirement. No more than two abreast, but you wouldn't have to fall back into the single line if the bill were to pass in its current form. So that's House Bill 2262. There is also a bill uh, called House Bill 1903. That's called the Speed Limit Bill. It would empower localities to lower the speed limit in residential and business districts below 25 miles per hour. The new low would be 15. So, for example, if Virginia Beach were to find that there was a certain area where they felt a lower speed limit would be good for the city, they could impose that if this bill passes. You can't do that right now. 25 is as low as you can go. And then the third piece of legislation, and this is really interesting. In the original budget bills for both the House and the Senate, there's a provision called item 407, which provides $5 million out of VDOT's budget that would be dedicated to multi-use long distance trails, planning, uh, development and construction shared use trails. It would kick in in the second year of the budget. Uh, and this is not an amendment someone's offering trying to get the votes. This is in the base budget. So unless somebody were to amend to get it out, when the budget's passed, that gets passed right with it. So that's very exciting. Uh, there are a number of specific amendments different legislators are trying to get in for uh, trails in their districts. We'll see how those fare. But I wanted BTAC to be aware of those three pieces of live legislation. Great. Thank you, Walter. Um, I that well, we're concluding our meeting. Um, I just wanted to let you all know, and James Rayner is not on this call, um, but he is actually going to step down from the commission. He's had some work conflicts um, with meeting um, this time frame for um, our meetings. He has some some meetings at work that are a conflict, so he's going to step down from the commission. Um, and we just wanted to, you know, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank him for our service and time that he has spent with us um, on this com committee. Um, and that's all I have. Uh, just a reminder that our next meeting is going to be Monday, March 15th, and um, I'm going to give some final comments or get some final comments from Elaine, our staff liaison. Thank you. Just really quickly, um, thank, I just wanted to thank everyone who has submitted um, their proposals for the TSA safety improvement um, capital improvement program. And um, if you do out there still have a, a thought and you just had forgotten to get it to me, if you do so in the next couple of days, the latest, I can probably still quick whip up a proposal and get that submitted. Um, the meeting is coming up next week. Um, but again, even if you miss the styling, if you just keep in the back of your mind, if when you're out and about and you see something, a, a, a missing connection, just get it to me and I'll see how we can go about where, how, where it's appropriate to go about um, possibly improving the infrastructure. Thank you.
All right. Well, if there are no further comments, thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you in a month. Thank you. Thank you.